Hi again, it's Professor Lusheen. This is lecture 19. Uh, it says hazardous materials on the screen here, but it's going to be basically compressed gases and hazardous waste. Um, also, I should note that um, as I was putting together this particular module and kind of looking at the content, I am going to be moving some things around. I probably You probably felt that uh, the electrical safety lecture could be longer, and I agree. So what I'm gonna be doing next semester as I move forward is electrical safety and arc flash are gonna be separated so I can focus on each one. And I'm gonna move them around so that the topics are better aligned. Uh, so in this particular uh, module, I'm gonna be moving uh, some of this content into uh, the welding. So it'll be welding and, um, which is lecture 20, and the cylinder safety, compressed gas safety, and then I'm going to be moving the hazardous waste into the, uh, I think, the process safety management hazardous waste operations. Because it fits, kind of fits all within that range. So, you know, this should be a quick, rather quick uh, lecture because I'm going to be dividing this one up. So compressed gases are covered under <laughs> 1910 101 subpart H. Uh, when we get to the hazardous waste, we're going to get into the resource Recovery and Conservation Act, or RICRA, which is an EPA. But there, there's, there's some crossover between OSHA and EPA from time to time. So with any compressed gases, and actually it would almost be better to have the welding lecture prior to this one, because in the welding lecture, we do talk about the canister, or the compressed gases, uh, the canisters. So uh, you should always inspect them when they're delivered, uh, make sure there's no damage. And so it shows here kind of the basic you know, design of the of the cylinder. Sorry, I said canister cylinder, uh, and how what they would look like. The type of PC, PSM they'd have or PSM uh, pounds per square inch. So the there's always a protective or screw on cap uh, on there to protect the the valve because if the valve gets damaged, it could turn into a rocket or a torpedo. And I actually provided a video of what happens when the the valve is broken off. Typically happens when you knock them over, but if you're handling it wrong, it could also occur. Uh, there's also should be labeling and notification whether it's a full or an empty uh, cylinder. <laughs> Sorry, I keep calling it canister. So one thing you look for is a bulge. So these canisters are reused. So you know it gets dropped off full, you use it, they send it back. Over time, and through mishandling, through exposure to heat, cold in the environment, the the structure of the cylinder can become weakened. And in this case, it's actually starting to bulge off. That's a failure. You have to take that out of service. These things need to be tested hydrostatically like uh, over a period of time as well. That's more about the people who are picking up and dropping them off and not you. But you should always, always, always inspect these things upon delivery or while they're in storage. Never try to use a cylinder that looks like it's damaged in some way shape or form or it's been exposed to heat cuts gouges things like that these things need to be handled properly because just a what may seem like a minor um, blemish on the outside could actually be a functional failure within the wall of the of the cylinder <laughs> here shows some some uh, corrosion uh, so you should have workers, there should be a plan and workers should be trained on how to properly, when they're received, to inspect, to properly handle, secure, to transport, and then put it in its ultimate storage place and make sure that everything is labeled properly. Once you receive it, it's gonna be, once it's gonna be taken from your storage and into use, it needs to be properly secured in its place, whether it's on a cart, whether it's in a, actually on a piece of equipment, once it's secured, then you can put on the safety relief or the relief valve. Um, and once in place, you slowly open the valve. <laughs> this should be unsaid. Never use the rollers to move heavy objects. But if it's a standard, somebody tried it. <laughs> Bad idea. Even if it's empty, don't do it because you could damage the cylinder. It has to be taken out of, out of circulation. Let's see here. Oh, never rest a cylinder against a table where you might be doing arc welding because you could actually then uh, energize the cylinder itself or maybe even damage it. Never lift from the, uh, from the cap. Boy, that'd be really bad. 
Never lift with a magnet. Avoid dragging or sliding. I mean, basically, and it always needs to be upright, too. You should never put it on its side. It's not designed for that. Use suitable hand carts, fork trucks, rolling platforms, whatever you need. But again, it, it needs to be put on something to be moved. And you should never really carry it either because um, you could drop it. They need to be secured in a place where they can't be tipped over, where they can't be contacted by uh, any sort of moving vehicle, and needs to be stored away from flammable liquids, gasoline. Here, it's, it's being stored in a place where it could make contact with a powered industrial truck for a forklift. You want to keep them out of aisleways, too, where people could accidentally bump into them, even if it's just a cart that they're pushing around. Uh, DOT requires things to be labeled and secured. So make sure it has that. Always make sure that it's put in a place that's not only safe, but it can't accidentally be knocked over or become unsecure when it's in use. Never force connections, never use any sort of tools for tightening or loosening. It always should be hand tight because um, you could over, I mean, you could basically uh, wreck the uh, threads when you're trying to use it. Only use regulators for uh, never cross them over. So if you're going to use one for acetylene or fueled gas, only use it for that. Same if you're using it for auction, only use it for that. Don't mix them because there could be some of the gas left over and then they mix and that's bad. Uh, open slowly. Um, you know, you're, you're supposed to only use your hand. Never use equipment or a wrench. Never hammer. <laughs> if it's frozen or corroded, contact a supplier or an expert. Uh, yeah. You should store fuel, gas, and oxygen 20 feet apart. OSHA also says that you can use like a five foot um, non combustible or fire rated wall, but it's better to store them separate. <sighs> yeah, don't store it near flammable things, never near flame. You should have a no smoking sign, things like that. If, it, if the gas is a poisonous gas, um, whoever's transporting or checking should always have an approved gas mask. It says by Bureau of Mines, but NIOSH approves uh, respirators as well. Uh, for implant transfer, especially if it's acetylene, make sure it's in accordance with the, with the American uh, Compressed Gas Association. Fitting work left van, east, okay, I'm not gonna cover that. Oh, this is a case report, I'm sorry. So, person had it in their van, oxygen acetylene cylinder over the weekend. And unfortunately, it had leaked. And this is what happened. It exploded. Um, and I believe it killed one person and the, the uh, passenger was severely injured. Why? Because acetylene oxygen has a very low and a very high, very wide range of flammable limits. So it doesn't take much for it to explode. It can be very rich to explode. So always store in a well-ventilated area. That pretty much goes for all types of gases. You should really, it always should be in a well-ventilated area and make sure you you understand the NFPA ratings, National Fire Protection ratings. Hydrogen is also a concern, it burns. Uh, I know for a while there, they were talking about moving us into a hydrogen fuel society or economy uh, because hydrogen can be collected by um, separating out oxygen and hydrogen from water. So we'd have almost an endless supply of hydrogen. The problem is, the, in order to compress it, you have to refrigerate it. So it'd be in a quantity that could be usable. And then it becomes really complicated with couplings and fillings and all that kind of other stuff. That's why we still use uh, gasoline, but then liquid petroleum compresses fairly easily uh, and into a liquid form, whereas hydrogen would take a lot more to do that. And then if something happens with a tank, it readily expands and gets released and then you have a big explosion. So if you're using hydrogen, if you've got it in tanks, it needs to be well labeled and treated properly. So now we're going to shift gears here real quick to hazardous waste. I want to do that because sometimes safety people don't get this experience um, and it is important. So RICRA, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, covers or talks about this main thing called cradle to grave. So a substance when it's generated, needs to have a manifest that follows it and labeling, so tracking. So here it's created, here's how it's stored, this is how it's transferred, then ultimately put into its final place or possibly recycled or possibly treated. Depends. But 
what you need to do, you need to know what the hazardous material is. It needs to be stored safely, properly, ensured that it doesn't leak. Um, and then the manifest kind of tracks what's there, when it was collected, and then you need to hire uh, or contract to have a group come in, safely remove it, and then they will dispose of it. And you gotta pay for that stuff. But for a, for a, you know, a long time ago, whether you look at like the Love Canal, that would be a great video to watch if you're interested in environmental or hazardous waste. People just put bad stuff in barrels and when it started leaking or looked bad, they just went and dumped it out in the back 40. Um, that means kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And then it leaks into the ground and it can, it can affect wildlife, it can affect vegetation. What's really scary is when it gets down into whether it leaks into a surface water or leaks into um, groundwater. If it leaks into groundwater, uh, people can get sick. That's what happened with Love Canal. Uh, or it, if it leaks into a surface, uh, like a river, a stream, bog, swamp, pond, um, it affects the aquatic life, infects it. So what is hazardous waste? I mean, you can read this stuff and I provided some really good resources from EPA. Um, also a group that collects hazardous waste. So you can kind of see it from both perspectives. Hazardous waste identification process, you know, whether it's solid, uh, whether it's liquid, whether it's whatever it needs to be done. Um, and there, I, I'm not gonna have you memorize. I'm just trying to give you a general idea. So like, uh, I mean, sure, chemicals are an easy one. That that's covered by by C. I think D covers uh, solid waste because um, there are solid wastes, like household solid wastes that you want to get rid of. They they don't have to. They aren't considered hazardous. Um, so I did actually cite one of the companies I did consulting with because they had fluorescent light bulbs. They were spent, but they had them kind of just sitting haphazardly all over the place, and they could break open and then mercury gets released. So uh, you need to have this accumulation sticker with it. It tells you when you started collecting it, because you're only supposed to store it for a certain period of time. They don't want it to go, oh, at the end of the year, let's get rid of everything. They want you to have controlled amounts that get removed on a regular basis. Um, so here under NR uh, 673.13, and I believe this is the Wisconsin listing, talks about waste management, labeling, and marking, accumulation time limits. It says no longer than a year, but you shouldn't wait that long. They had waited years and years. This is years of accumulation, and they're just kind of set back in rooms. Make it easy to break them, break them open. And then cleaning up mercury is a lot more expensive having this stuff hauled away. So here's a hazardous waste sticker. Talks about you know, who you are, uh, when you start accumulating it, what's there, any hazardous stuff, and it needs to be clearly marked, clearly marked and securely uh, stored. And this is a manifest that would go along with the, the, the generation, the cradle to grave, and who's handling it in the, all the way to its ultimate resting place. Veolia is a nationwide uh, hazardous waste, or they, they do all kinds of different waste collection. Here they do recycling, treatment, service, this, I mean, I, I've seen they're out of Milwaukee, and I know a lot of people, they used to be called Onyx. So they come out, they can actually ident help you identify, they can provide certain things, but you know, you pay them to come out ever so often, and they will collect your hazardous waste. Uh, if you're residential, your, your local town or county may host household hazardous waste. Take advantage of that. Of that. Sometimes you have to pay to like recycle electronics or spent oil if you change your own oil or just things you bought a long time ago and it's just like it's, it seems old and you need to drop it off. Sometimes it's free, sometimes you have to pay a little bit, but that's the proper way to do it versus jumping, dumbing it down the drain and possibly exposing the public. So here's what I have here for you. I've got the OSHA topics for compressed gas and equipment, the OSHA topic hazardous waste, the EPA basics of hazardous waste, the Veolia page that you can take a look at. And then here, Granger sells the uh, stickers. Uh, what is it? It's a pack of 25 for $22. And then here's a copy of like a manifest that you can just get for free online. So that's pretty much it for lecture nine. Again, this is probably our shortest video, but I will be dividing this up and supplementing other lectures in order to expand the uh, electrical safety and the art flash.